the Equality Act is a shield, not a sword. It is there to protect people of all characteristics, whether they're young or old, male or female, black or white, gay or straight. You can be black and be a Tory and be successful. And we see variations of this argument in schools. Uh, where you're, you're quite swatty, that's not really the black thing to do, and so on. And it is, in, it is its own form of racism. Inflation here has hit a new 40-year high. The British pound has fallen to its lowest level ever against the US dollar. The still new prime minister announced just a short time ago that she will step down. Truss is now the UK's shortest serving prime minister. A short time ago, it was announced that Rishi Sunak is set to become Britain's next prime minister. We know that our country is great because every day we see, you know, thousands of people trying to get here. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so frustrated about, with the narrative about how terrible the UK is. Hello, I'm David Ignatius. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post. It's a wonderful event. I'm really glad to be here. And I'm especially pleased to be joined by Britain's Secretary Kemi Badenoch, who has two roles in Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's cabinet. She is the Secretary of State for International Trade and also the Minister for Women and Equalities. Secretary, Secretary Bidnock, welcome to The Washington Post. Thank you, David. <laughs> so let's um, begin by talking about your journey. Mm -hmm. You, as the video said, spent part of your childhood in Nigeria and the United States. Tell us briefly about your path uh, to being minister in this conservative government and how your personal experience growing up, making your way, uh, has shaped your approach to politics. Uh, okay, so yes, you're absolutely right. I grew up in Nigeria. I had one year in the States in Omaha because my mother was working at the university there, but very much uh, a Nigerian child who left in 96 to come to the UK because of all the economic turmoil that was taking place in the country at that time. And I grew up in a very comfortable sort of middle-class family and moving to the UK, being a, a first-generation immigrant, it al almost always drops you uh, down the class level. So I went from being middle to working class and had to work my way back up. And it is a testament to what a wonderful country uh, the United Kingdom is that I was able to start from there and 25 years later be sitting in front of you as trade secretary. It's quite an extraordinary story. It wouldn't work the other, other way around. Uh, it's very hard for anyone who is uh, of foreign origin to even get citizenship uh, in a country like Nigeria, let alone be in the cabinet and helping to run the country. And politics was never something that I'd thought about. I grew up under military governments, so there was no democracy. It just wasn't something that happened. But be, living in a, you know, a liberal, free democracy and seeing what uh, stops a country from working uh, made me uh, very centre-right. The Conservative Party was the natural party for me to join. And simply uh, having the experience of people wanting you to succeed based on merit, not because of quotas or any other such thing, uh, has really informed my politics. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to reinforce now that I'm in government. So you and your Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, give a very different, a diverse uh, face with your other cabinet members for the Tory party. Mm. Uh, and I just want to ask you about, about the Tory party, um, very much a, a party changing with Britain, but its immigration policy is, is quite a traditionally conservative. Uh, it, is, it is not a party that's welcoming uh, immigrants. Uh, and I want you to, to, to explain that. And, and is Tory immigration policy your own, or are you somewhat different? So our migration policy is very welcoming to legal migration, less so to illegal migration. And as uh, a government, one of the things that you know, we should do is have secure borders. And it's very frustrating for someone like me to talk about migration and often have it misrepresented as us not wanting anyone to come to the country. We welcome people who are skilled. We welcome people who are refugees. What we don't welcome are people who cheat the system, who claim to be asylum seekers when they're economic migrants, uh, and people 
people who abuse the system because it actually makes life more difficult for those truly vulnerable people that we're trying to help. And I've spoken to people who have run from dangerous places. The people they're running from are also coming to the UK. And if you just have an open borders policy that doesn't distinguish or filter between those in need and those who want to exploit, it'll be bad for everyone, especially those who are most vulnerable. Your country, uh, Madam Secretary, has been through a whirlwind the last uh, few months. Uh, and I, I want to ask you uh, both about the loss of your sovereign, Queen Elizabeth, and also about the, the turmoil within your party. But let, let's start with uh, the, the death in September of, of Queen Elizabeth and the accession of the new King Charles III. Uh, just tell us what that meant to you, what, what the monarchy means to you, whether you have any personal reflections of these two people, uh, the late queen and the new king, that you could share with our audience. Uh, it's, it was a very extraordinary moment for the country because uh, Queen Elizabeth had been there for so long. She had just become part of everybody's lives. You know, she's on the money that we pay with, she's on the stamps, her picture's everywhere. And you just sort of absorb, uh, you absorb this icon without really uh, recognizing just how much of an impact their presence is having on your life. And the impact is really about stability. It's about certainty. And as we live in a world that is a lot less uh, certain and actually feels a lot less stable, having a sovereign, a monarch who's there, who provides constancy, doesn't get involved in politics, doesn't pick a side, is actually really special. And I often find uh, family and friends who aren't British asking, why do you need a queen? That's so weird, it, it seems medieval. And, uh, and the response is, if it's not broken, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And while it is unusual, it does work. And her dying was, uh, I think it was actually quite emotionally traumatic for all of us. I'd never met her. Um, I'd met King Charles, uh, Prince Charles as he was then. I'd met Prince William and Prince Harry uh, within my role uh, as a minister. And seeing the outpouring of grief reminded me also of my own loss. I lost my father earlier this year. And uh, having a royal family almost feels like a sort of substitute or surrogate family and you go through life with them. You watch them when they're born, you see them when they get married, and it's, it's like having a, a distant cousin that you haven't met before, you know everything about their lives. And when they die, you also feel the grief even when you haven't met them. And uh, I was very lucky because I was in government, I was able to attend her funeral and uh, also watch the accession, uh, or the acclamation rather, of Prince Charles to, to King Charles. So being there at those special moments, we haven't had one of those since 1952. It's, you know, no one in living memory uh, who was, in, um, was around who had done that previous uh, accession. So it's very special indeed. Uh, that, that's a moving description. I'm sorry for the loss of, of, your, of your father. Thank you. Um, the other big event that happened in the last two months was the very brief, I think the briefest in history, reign of your Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who was there and then all of a sudden she wasn't there. Uh, and um, that was accompanied by a, a radical reaction from the financial markets mm. to the proposal she made for significant government uh, spending at a time of, of uh, real inflation in Britain. Um, Prime Minister Sunak, who replaced her, had opposed that program mm. when she first announced it. I'm, I'm curious what your own view was when the program was announced, whether you, like Sunak, said, I don't think so. So it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's easy for me to answer this question, or a little bit easier than uh, it normally would as a member of both Liz Truss's government and Rishi Sunak's government, because I also stood for the leadership. So we were all able to make our arguments at the, at the same time. And I had known both uh, Rishi and Liz, as I call them, for a long time because I had been their junior minister. And people kept asking me, well, when, when they got to the final two, who should you pick? And I said, well, if you want someone who's going to be more conservative and steady, you go with Rishi. But if you want someone who's going to be a maverick and radical, go with Liz. I was not keen on uh, pushing tax cuts primarily as a policy. 
uh, I do believe in tax cuts. I'm a small state conservative. But the problem that we had at the time of that contest was a cost of living crisis inflation. And I, I'm an engineer by training. So systems thinking, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And the problem we were trying to solve was a cost of living crisis. So my view was that tax cuts uh, and certainly an arms race on tax cuts was not the answer. But the thing about politics is that everybody makes their argument. When somebody wins, it loses consent has to come into play. Everybody needs to get behind the, uh, the winner. And so even though I wasn't 100% convinced by the argument, I recognized that there was a good argument for uh, the proposals which she put forward. I think where it went wrong was not necessarily with the package, but in how it was sold. And that's why communication is so critical in politics. We didn't bring people along with us. What Liz was trying to do was uh, stimulate growth very quickly uh, to try and re sort of reboost the economy. But what people heard, unfortunately, wasn't that. What they heard was tax cuts, money for the rich, uh, and that wasn't what she was trying to do. But unfortunately, that's how it came across. And if you can't bring, bring people with you, uh, you will lose not just the argument, but you will lose power. And very sadly, that is what happened. Uh, and Liz being Liz, the sort of thing that would have taken other people a much longer period with her being very radical, very maverick, it happened very quickly. She certainly lost the confidence of, of the financial markets. Uh, so we'll talk about your own ideas as Minister of Trade for economic uh, policies going forward. But mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you about your visit to Washington. We're delighted that you're here, that you're here at, at this uh, conference. You'll be meeting with the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adiemo, mm -hmm. uh, during your visit, uh, talking about Britain's uh, business-friendly environment, uh, and I'm sure about your hopes for, for trade uh, agreements. Um, uh, your uh, ministry says that you'll also be, uh, be discussing how trade can break down barriers for women as business owners. And given our topic at this summit today, I wanna ask you to explain that specifically for our audience. So it's, it just goes back to the fundamentals and principles of what trade is about. It's that free exchange, people being able to buy and sell as easily as possible and removing the barriers, whether it's tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers, sort of the bureaucracy and the hoops that you have to jump through in order to, to sell a product. And one of the challenges that women have as entrepreneurs is that it's just, it's just tougher generally. Tougher because we spend more of our lives uh, caring for, for others. So we tend not to be able to get going. Uh, it's harder to access capital and therefore at harder to travel for those reasons and therefore makes it more difficult to trade, to sell your goods abroad. Uh, a lot of our research shows that it's harder to get investment. And these aren't things that correlate with the biology of being a woman. It's just the reality of being a woman in terms of the lifestyles that we tend to have. And anything that we can do to liberalize trading, making it easier, will have a disproportionate benefit uh, for women in particular. And that's one of the reasons why it's important for me with my dual roles. Let me ask about the magnitude of your challenge. Uh, I don't simply mean in trade here, but broadly for this government in e economic policy. Britain has really been struggling in recent years. <laughs> define <That's>, struggle. <laughs> well, I, I, I will define struggle. I, I, I gathered some statistics with, with help from colleagues. On present trends, they find the average Slovenian household will be better off than its British counterpart by 2024. And the average Polish family will move ahead by the end of, of the decade. In other words, the trend lines for Britain have been going in the wrong direction. You can see these in any uh, uh, compilation of, of, uh, of statistical evidence. The Conservatives have been running Britain now for 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know the, this country, its, its trajectory is your party's responsibility. Simple question is, how is the party that's been running the country as it's had these difficulties going to get Britain out of its malaise? What's the formula for that that you would offer for this audience, but more broadly? Okay. 
So first of all, I would challenge uh, some of those figures. I've seen those statistics before that show uh, that the trend is bad for the UK and uh, less so for other countries. Uh, we don't agree for various reasons. We're starting from a different place uh, in terms of base, so it depends on which specific metric. But I won't go into the, de into the details of that. You're right, we have been running the country for 12 years. First of all, the first five years as part of a conservative liberal coalition, and then under successive prime ministers, not just David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and now Rishi Sunak. And we have been almost regenerating while we've been uh, been governing. For those of you who watch Doctor Who, the series, it's almost like, you know, we get a new doctor, this is the new prime minister, and each of them has had a different vision. <laughs> each of them has had a different vision, which is actually tackling new problems that are, that are coming into play. So one of the things that uh, I try and emphasize is that the issues have been changing. When we came in to power in 2010, this was before I became a member of parliament, uh, we were in the middle of a big recession. The financial crisis had just happened. There were so many issues. And those first five years were all about fixing the economy, fixing finances. Uh, then 2015, we have a, a world where everybody's angry about globalization. You would have seen it uh, from the sort of uh, the more Trumpian politics that was coming into play, everyone becoming more protectionist. That manifested uh, in our country with leaving the European Union, which I, by the way, voted for. And that was us deciding, different people voting for different reasons, but us deciding that we wanted to be more global in our outlook and not locked into decision making with 27 other countries. That used up so much political capital and political energy, just trying to do something that different. I can't explain how tough it is. It's, it's like a state. It's like, you know, New York deciding that it doesn't want to be in the United States. Very, very tough, very difficult decision. People misrepresenting it as xenophobia or us being inward looking. But uh, decisions like that, which are made for the long term, often have short term consequences. So there's no denying that changing the way you uh, do things will create some initial friction. And just as we were raring to go about, about to you know, press go on the rocket boosters, COVID happens. And we have a pandemic that really uh, shakes the core of the country because of how our, our economy is structured. We look at the supply chains, for example. We look at um, uh, the amount of money that we spent on furlough, paying people to stay at home, something that many other countries either didn't do or didn't do in quite the same way. All of those things have had an impact. But if we were not doing well, we would not have been able to survive the pandemic. We certainly would not have been able to come out of the EU and still be uh, trading globally. A lot of our trade is increasing across the world. It's falling in certain places. So there's a lot of work to do. But you asked about the opportunities. And what we're hoping is that things calm down uh, in terms of Don't all we? of the things Don't that are happening uh, externally and just allow us to really... that's a global hope. <laughs> Absolutely. I think people want things to be more boring for, uh, for, for some time so, to come. And so then, we can, um, then we can do more. Let, let me ask a, a pointed question. When we think about the British economy, mm. frankly, the question remains, was Brexit a good idea? Mm. And there's some economic evidence that there's a, there's a real economic cost mm -hmm. to it. Uh, and I'd be interested in, in, in your views. For example, uh, you hear some discussion about um, moving closer to the European common commercial policy, mm -hmm. common standards, which would make it easier to trade with Europe. Yeah. Is that a good idea? Um, yes, common standards are a good idea. So we didn't leave because we didn't want to have those common standards. Those were some of the good things about being in the European Union, and we still want to work closely with them. So if you were to ask me why I voted for Brexit, it was two things. The first was that the discussions that were being had at EU level were about more and more political integration. Uh, you know, wanting to have a single currency was something that uh, kept, just, just wouldn't go away. Wanting to have uh, a shared army was a discussion that kept coming up. But the more close political integration we didn't feel was working for us because when we asked for what we thought were little things, we didn't get them. And if you think back to what happened that almost triggered the whole Brexit uh, thing, it was us wanting to change a few things around social security and our Prime Minister David Cameron going to the EU, Angela Merkel 
uh, in particular, and saying, well, can we have some of these changes? And the answer was no. And for many people, there, there seemed to be this epiphany that we can't even influence decision making within this block. And if they want to do more integration, maybe this is the time to get off the train. It didn't mean that we didn't like the group, but if we were thinking long term, looking at where's the middle class going to be in 2050, what's the world going to look like? Maybe getting off now uh, and allowing them to do more of what they wanted to do would be the easier thing. And that was uh, what motivated people like me. It wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't because once we left, everything would be great and perfect. But one of the most frustrating things, um, and for those of you who are political, you will understand this, is having people within your party or within your particular group, whichever one it is, who make arguments that are not coherent, that make it seem as if everything is easy, that it's just because of these bad people. And if only we got rid of these bad people, everything would be OK, or these people making these decisions. It's just not, um, it, it's just not realistic. So, there are trade-offs for everything. And I felt that the trade-offs for Brexit in the long term would be worth it. I want to ask you one uh, last question that deals with your other portfolio uh, as uh, Minister of Equalities. Mm -hmm. So uh, a BBC headline described you, and I'm just quoting, as anti-woke darling of the right. And uh, one of your first uh, acts in this role as minister was meeting with Kira Bell, mm. who was prescribed puberty blocking drugs at 16, but later said she regretted the decision. You got a lot of criticism for meeting her mm -hmm. uh, from people who felt that it, this was not respectful of uh, transgender mm -hmm. advocates in the community. What, what message did you want to send in, in, in this meeting? And talk more broadly about these cultural issues as a final. Okay. Uh, so people call me anti-woke. Uh, it's, it's actually not a word that I use. I don't like the word woke because I think it trivializes something far more serious uh, that's taking place. So I like to think of myself as pro-common sense rather than anti-woke. Uh, uh, anti and uh, the job I have covers uh, protected characteristics, as we call them. There are nine of them. But some of the areas where we have the most contentious debates on race, on religion, on sex and gender, on sexual orientation, gender reassignment, which is uh, where the transgender category falls into. They are all my job. And it doesn't matter what you do in that job, somebody somewhere is going to be angry. And I think that one of the challenges we've had is uh, the word trans means different things to different people. We have a definition roughly in law. It's probably a bit outdated. But there are all sorts of people, Kira Bell being one of them, who are finding that they are being classified as trans when they aren't. She was a lesbian. She was a gay child who uh, read some stuff online and felt she was a boy and didn't get the right clinical help she should have had. And the result was her breasts were removed, her ovaries were removed, she was effectively sterilized. And by the time she realized, it was too late. She was very angry about that. And my belief is that she didn't get the appropriate level of care. The clinic which she went to, uh, that service has been stopped after an investigation. So very serious stuff. And for anyone to say that I shouldn't meet somebody who has had this experience doesn't understand what the work of a politician is. I need to meet everybody. I need to understand uh, both or all perspectives uh, or whatever they might be, so I can get a clear picture. And the picture that I got was that while we're looking after people who are trans or who have gender dysphoria, which is um, how we have been looking at the issue, we need to make sure the people who are not are not put on a pathway where they make decisions that are irreversible and which will change their lives forever. And I think that that's a pretty common sense uh, position to have. What I have found amazing and extraordinary is that even saying this means that you get called a bigot, you get called anti-trans, you have a lot of people attacking you who are not actually listening to what, uh, to what you're saying. And my response is not to be afraid and to keep pushing for what the right thing is. If people like me are too scared because of what someone says on Twitter, then we're going to be in a really bad place. And it's my job to defend those people who can't defend themselves, and I'll continue to do that. So Secretary Kemi Badenoch, described as a rising star uh, of the Tory go government, 
Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion. Um, we uh, are going to turn now to Fox National Security uh, correspondent Jennifer Griffin, someone who has beaten me on too many stories, <laughs> a wonderful reporter. Uh, she'll be out here shortly after this short video. Stay with us. Thanks to Secretary Bidnock. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.